Hi, I'm Louis Falgu, and welcome to The Music Breakdown. And today, I'm here to cover every studio album of the extremely influential and essential progressive rock band, and other genres, Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd is one of those bands that gets people into music, and they're an absolutely seminal group of musicians who have created quite a few of the most essential and iconic albums in the rock canon. On top of that, they're a personal favorite of mine, so I couldn't think of a better retrospective to do. So, we will begin with the band's debut studio album, The Piper at the Gates of Dawn. That gets something I can't explain. At this early stage in the band's career, they were comprised of Roger Waters, Richard Wright, and Nick Mason, the three members who would continue throughout much of their discography after this, and the, really the front man, Sid Barrett, who is only the front man for this one album. And boy, does the band sound young on this record. They sound young, they sound like they're full of creative energy, and uh, also extremely English. This album is a very silly psychedelic rock album. Not to say that there's never any hints of seriousness on here, uh, namely the nine-minute experimental rock opus Interstellar Overdrive, which is just stunning, featuring this amazing riff that gives way into this spacious, eerie, and psychedelic experiment. This It's just such a fucking trip. But besides that, you've got a ton of tracks of rather silly lyrics, including lyrics about gnomes and a scarecrow, and how uh, Sid Barrett has a bike that you can ride if you like. And these sillier songs are actually genuinely funny at points, namely The Gnome, which uh, is just such a sweet little song, that one. So no doubt does this album have a very youthful sense of humor, but it's not... I wouldn't say it's defined by that. I mean, you've also got tracks like Astronomy Domine, if that's how you pronounce it, which is just such an amazing space rock song and psychedelic rock song. You know, it's just, ugh, it's such a great opener to this album. And I already mentioned some of the more experimental elements, but another thing I'd like to call out is that just wild guitar solo on um, Take Up Thy Stethoscope and Walk, which is just fucking nuts. <laughs> it's, it's so weird and dissonant. The album also has its more exciting moments, like Lucifer Sam, which is a great tune. And really, the songwriting on this record is very strong for a debut here. And it's not just the songwriting, but it's also just the sonic texture of the whole thing. I mean, it is very psychedelic and colorful of an album, but it also has a lot of kinetic energy. This is nowhere near the Pink Floyd that most people know from the 70s. I mean, there's not even a single thing about this record that hints towards that. And as a result, it ends up sounding like an album by a completely different band, which gives it its own personality and flavor, and no doubt there are people who prefer this record, and it makes sense. That being said, I think the album kind of fizzles out in the latter half. There are tracks like Chapter 24, which are just complete non-songs. <sighs> However, the first half of this thing is extremely strong, and even the second half rounds out the album very well with the track Bike and, of course, Interstellar Overdrive, which is just, oh, it's just, I can't stress how amazing of a track that is. So it's not an album you want to overlook, is basically what I'm saying. I know a mouse and he hasn't got a house. I don't know why I call him Gerald. He's getting rather old, but he's a good mouse. You're the kind of girl that... Then at last the mighty ship Descending on a point of flame So A Saucer Full of Secrets is the first Pink Floyd album in which guitarist David Gilmour is brought on. And uh, he definitely adds quite a bit to the record, although I wouldn't say that he sounds quite as distinct as he would later on down the line. Now, the album still continues in that psychedelic rock direction, but it, it seems quite different from The Piper at the Gates of Dawn. I mean, sure, you've still got the humorous elements like the track Corporal Clegg, which prominently features Kazoo. But besides that, I'd say the album takes itself a lot more seriously on tracks like Set the Controls for the Heart of the Sun, which just sounds like, I mean, yeah, it sounds like uh, you're preparing a spaceship to fly out into space, or perhaps that you're already in space. I mean, 
It's a very understated track, but a very spacious one, or just a really neat song. And tracks like Let There Be More Light, which feel more grandiose than anything on Piper, and uh, certainly hint at a kind of seriousness that I don't think that record ever really demonstrated, save for maybe Astronomy Domine. And Sid Barrett's influence on this record is felt much, much less, because by this point, Sid Barrett was already starting to get kind of out of it. There's the famous story of all of a sudden, Sid Barrett was just empty-eyed and like, he lost all of his youthful energy and everything that he ever had that made him a person. Now we can all speculate on what did that, but I don't think it really matters. The fact is that it happened, and as a result, yeah, he's not as prominent on this record. Although he does get his own song here, Jug Band Blues, which is good, but not as strong as pretty much any of the material that he penned on Piper. And this album yet again features a long form experimental piece in the title track here. It's even weirder than Interstellar Overdrive. There aren't nearly as many moments of levity or familiarity until the end where some pretty organs come in. It becomes a prettier piece, but before then this thing is scary. It is dismal and it is dark and it's unlike anything the band had done before, really. I mean, you know, there are similarities between it and Interstellar Overdrive, but again, this one goes even farther. And ultimately, I would say this album feels even more psychedelic than the last one, but it just isn't as strong. The songwriting isn't as great, and the production has not aged quite as well. Tracks like Let There Be More Light would have done better with the production techniques of later Floyd. In this era, sometimes the mixing seems a little off, and things don't quite have the impact that they should. Uh, not to say that the album doesn't sound good, but it just, I don't know, not as distinct as the last one. However, it's still a great record, and one that very much complements Piper at the Gates of Dawn before it. Still feels like the same band, but that's gonna change in uh, not too long. So More is a soundtrack to the film of the same name. This is the first soundtrack album that Pink Floyd would fully create. Uh, there's another one down the line. I haven't seen the film, full disclosure. Now, as a result of it being a soundtrack, it is a disjointed record, to say the least. And it's more disjointed than it even needed to be. There are quite a number of songs that are written on this record, and they're all on the first side, except for Ibiza Bar, which is on the second side, in between tracks that are not full-fledged songs. You know, I would understand if the first half of the record were all the songs, and the second half were all the instrumental score pieces, but it's not even structured that way, which is kinda odd. So, as a full album, it's not even as cohesive of an experience as it could be. Not that it really could be a super cohesive experience, given the kinds of works that are on the record. But yeah, this is definitely one of the least essential and most forgettable Pink Floyd releases, which is not to say that it's not without its strengths, because it does actually have quite a few good tracks on this thing. I mean, for one thing, the Nile song in Ibiza Bar is the closest thing to hard rock the band ever made. I mean, hell, it, it is hard rock. Granted, both songs are practically the same song, although there is a bit of a different approach to each. And the track Up the Kyber is an extremely weird jazz fusion-y piece. It's uh, it gotta be heard to be believed. And this album contains the song Cymbaline, which is a great song. Just a really pretty track. But other moments are not as strong. And once you get into the second half of this record, where it becomes all the score, this stuff really ranges from being all right to just total crap. Perhaps within the context of the film it's perfectly fine, but here there's really no need to hear it. I will say the main theme is interesting as this sort of synth-led um, uh, of a track. It's, it's a neat track, it's not great, but it's neat. But other moments like more blues and a Spanish piece just leave you wondering why you ever needed or wanted to hear them. Overall, it's just a really disjointed record. It's fine, and it's worth hearing if you're already a Pink Floyd fan, but I wouldn't recommend this one. So, 
So, Amagama is the most confused album in the entire Pink Floyd discography. I mean, for one thing, it's a double album, but it's a mixture between a live album and a studio album. One disc is a live album, and one disc is a studio album, however, it's also all the same album. It's kind of weird. I mean, you could almost look at them as two separate albums, but I can't. I'm forced to look at them as one, and uh, so that's how we'll judge it. Now, the first disc, the live disc, is really great. I mean, this is a really great capturing of a great live performance of all of these songs. Astronomy Domine, Careful With That Axe Eugene, Set the Controls for the Heart of the Sun, and A Saucer Full of Secrets, all of which are performed excellently, superbly, at times perhaps even better than their studio versions. I mean, the version of A Saucer Full of Secrets on here is definitely better than the one on the original album. It is even crazier! And the version of Careful With That Axe Eugene on this album is THE essential version. I mean, wow, what an incredible fucking performance here. And that scream that leads into the rockier bit of this song, holy shit, it's awesome! And also a little scary. But yeah, great live performance. Really, if this were just a live disc, it'd be a great live disc. And I mean, it is even in the context of this record. And on the studio side of the disc, the band basically had no ideas. So what you've got are four avant-garde pieces, each composed by a different member of the band. You've got Richard Wright with Sisyphus, which is really lackluster. I mean, it's got its cooler moments, but uh, overall it sounds grainy and just not that creative, honestly. And then you've got Roger Waters, who gives several species of small furry animals gathered together in a cave and grooving with a Pict. And you've also got Grant Chester Meadows. Now, Grantchester Meadows is fine as a little pleasant guitar piece and a little nice little song, but god, after seven minutes, this thing gets so goddamn grating to me because they just have the same damn bird loop the entire time. This fucking bird trip starts to just grate my ears. It's so annoying. Like, I understand the purpose. It's trying to make it sound like it's being played out in the open, but god, it just does not work. And if it was gonna happen, it shouldn't have happened throughout the entire song. It just, some variation would have been nice. However, Several Species is, I'm not even gonna lie, it's really fucking entertaining. I actually really enjoy it. Roger Waters just making a bunch of weird sounds. And it's really fucking stupid. It's really stupid, but I'm sure he knew that. And the way it plays with um, the with stereo is also really nice. Uh, different sounds from ear to ear. It's weird. It's funny. It's silly. It's goofy, but it's fun. Now, David Gilmour's piece, The Narrow Way, is actually the best um, of these four pieces, in my opinion. It really shows David Gilmour's talents, actually, and especially his guitar talents. I mean, this is the first time that I really feel like David Gilmour sounds like David Gilmour on the guitar. Um, and it's separated into three parts that all work together, but it's the third part, which is especially great, which is the longest one, where it really gets into the song, and it's just a great song, a real gem. And then Nick Mason gives us the Grand Vizier's Garden Party, which is total crap. It's total crap. He just plays some drum fills and loops them and plays them backwards and filters them through some reverb. It's just, it's really not interesting. And holy shit, does it get old over the course of this thing's runtime. I don't really know what he was going for with this piece, but this, I mean, maybe he thought he could make some cool sounds with the drums, but I, at least here it didn't work. So yeah, Amagama, it's a weird one. It's a weird record. I mean, especially considering the second side is full of avant-garde pieces, and some of which are extremely strange. It's a weird record. But, uh, you know, when you take its strengths with its weaknesses, I think the strengths definitely overpower the weaknesses, especially for the live disc here. And overall, I think it's a solid release. It just needed more focus, and I mean, god, it also would have been nice if some of the band members could provide better works than they did. Mother is probably the first Pink Floyd album that sounds like what we now know the band is. However, not throughout the entire record, more so in the opening track, the Adam Hart Mother Suite. This song is, and I hate to use this word, but epic. It's an epic suite. 
thing's 23 minutes long, it's a side long piece, and it prominently features a chorus and uh, even brass instruments and, you know, stuff that the band was not playing. They hired other musicians to play. It feels like a very composed composition. And each movement is great in its own right, although I will say that once it gets into the avant-garde section, it doesn't really fit. But whatever, the, the piece is great. It's got a lot of great moments. The main theme on some of these movements are just excellent and they really, really sticky. And the chorus just does a fantastic job. I mean, of course, the hired musicians all are phenomenal on this piece. However, Floyd themselves, honestly, not so much. You can tell that they were getting used to this new sound that they were exploring and they were not ready to play in this thing just yet. Nick Mason's fills are often sloppy and sometimes even out of time. And just the playing from the band overall seems sloppy, a little too loose. Like, they're not quite in tune with the professionalism of the rest of the musicians around them, which I guess is to be expected, but it does hinder the piece a little bit. Which isn't to knock it too much. I mean, I love this fucking piece. It's, it's great. It, it really is. But, um, you know, eh, you can tell the band wasn't all there yet. Now, on side two, we get three little songs, more in line with the kind of stuff that you found on more, um, or with the songs that you found on more anyway. There's uh, Roger Waters' song, If, which is pleasant. It's got some dumb lyrics, but it's pleasant. And then you've got Richard Wright's song, Summer 68, which is a really strong pop song, actually. It's very good. Uh, I like it a lot. And David Gilmour's song here, Fat Old Son, straight up sounds like a Beatles song. I mean, it's fantastic. Like, it's, it's really fucking good. Like, it's a really great song, a, re a real gem in the band's catalog. And really, all three of these little songs sound extremely influenced by the Beatles. Very Beatles-esque. And I say that as a compliment. I mean, they're, they're, they're solid songs. And then the album closes out with the piece Alan's Psychedelic Breakfast. And this may be controversial, but it's actually my favorite track here. Each of the three movements just so brilliantly represents a peaceful, pleasant morning. You even have got sound effects of like people cooking breakfast, which is really pleasant to the ears if you've ever enjoyed a breakfast at home. Um, granted, the people eating the breakfast isn't quite as pleasant to the ears, but whatever, I can forgive it. And I just really enjoy the guitar piece here. One of the movements is just so lovely and pleasant. I mean, this is truly perhaps the happiest and the most warm and welcoming Pink Floyd has ever sounded. It's really fantastic, I think. And overall, Adam Hart Mother is a very strong record. Um, it's probably the first time the band has sounded this strong since Piper. And again, you can really see them finding their sound, which is interesting to hear as well. Heart Mother was the band finding their sound, Metal is the band nailing their sound. Now this album features a similar format to Adam Heart Mother in that one side is comprised entirely of one long 20 minute song and the other side is comprised of multiple tracks. Although here it's reversed in that the side long song Echoes is the final track. And this album opens so goddamn strong with one of these days. Just holy shit, what a fucking kick instrumental with this super deep bass line colored out by these shots of keyboard and this just continues for like three or so minutes and you, you start to wonder you know what's gonna happen because the track just keeps feeling like it's building and building and building up to something but that climax is definitely uh, it's delayed a little bit until the bass gets chopped up through a noise gate and you've got, uh, I believe it's Nick Mason, I could be wrong, saying one of these days I'm going to cut you into little pieces as the band just fucking kicks in as hard as they ever have. It's like the heaviest the band has possibly ever sounded with every band member playing at their best to make this the most hard-hitting introduction of their career. It is just such an amazing track to open up the album, and brilliantly, it is followed up with perhaps the softest piece of music on the album, A Pillow of Winds. 
an extremely pleasant and floating song colored out by just tons of shimmering guitar notes. And it really does just feel like you're just getting lifted up throughout the entire song. It's so nice. This is followed up by the song Fearless, which has an excellent ascending guitar melody. And again, this is such a pleasant song. I mean, the band, the band is really nailing pleasant at this point in its career. This is followed up by two tracks that don't fare quite as well. Um, the song San Tropez is nice, it's relaxing, it's comforting, it's a nice little pop song, but, uh, you know, it's not one of the band's best. And then that moves into the blues parody Seamus, which is silly, I guess, and entertaining from that angle, but it's really nothing special. However, what this track does serve to do is close out this side and prepare you for just the most incredible fucking 20 minutes of music that you will ever hear, the sidelong masterpiece echoes. This song is like absolute heaven. It is so beautiful and haunting, and at points even kind of terrifying. I mean, this thing is, it, oh, it's just brilliant. It definitely helps that the actual song everything is built around is great as well. It's so beautiful and kind of mysterious, especially the vocal melody here and the harmonies. And the chorus here is beautiful and it's followed up by these wonderful ascending and descending guitar melodies. But the guitar sounds so watery and spacious. I mean, this entire track, it just feels like there's so much room to all the sounds that you're in the center of here. And especially on a nice surround system, this thing sounds absolutely breathtaking and the song progresses through each of its sections wonderfully i love the sort of jammy and kind of funky section towards the second movement of the song i would say i mean it's not actually broken up into movements but it may as well be david gilmour just colors this part out with some great soloing that's just an absolute treat to hear until this eventually gives way to this cavernous ambient section, which some people have dubbed the whale cries section. Because of this just terrifying guitar sound that Gilmore uses here that sounds like screaming aliens or I don't even know what. And it's a section that really builds tension, which the band capitalizes on with the next bit where they start to build and build and build to get back into the song. The keyboard work in this section too, I've got to call out, is so good. And there's one point during this buildup where the band just releases into this orgasmic section of music that is so floaty. It feels like it's lifting you up to the skies and just levitating you. And when the band finally returns to the song, it is wondrous. This song, I can't emphasize how amazing it is. One of the best tracks of the band's career. And undoubtedly, I think the moment where if you were a Pink Floyd fan, before Dark Side of the Moon, and you were there for this, I can imagine that you were blown away by what the band had given you, because it still blows me away to this day. And overall, Metal is just a really fantastic record, and it's definitely the start of the era that we now think of when we think of Pink Floyd. Now, I doubt that the band looked at this release as a major release. I'm sure if any of them thought about their discography, they probably imagined as metal and then Dark Side of the Moon, as most people do. I mean, even I do. But this album does exist. This is a soundtrack to the movie La Valle. I don't know how to pronounce that. I probably fucked it up. I'm sorry. Another film that I haven't seen, but it's the second soundtrack album that Pink Floyd does for another um, film that isn't, you know, their own and uh, more being the only other one. Now this album is definitely better than more, but it's still nothing altogether special. I mean, really this record kind of just feels like a contractual obligation more than anything, and I'm not even sure that it was, but it just feels like it. This is probably the most song-oriented that Pink Floyd has been since more, though. And uh, in this era of the band, sandwiched between metal and Dark Side of the Moon, I think that's an interesting thing to hear on its own, which makes this worth hearing for Pink Floyd fans, to hear the band make an album of, you know, an album-oriented towards its songs, as opposed to songs oriented towards their respective albums. 
And they write a solid track list of pop tunes here, and some rock songs, and it's all good, you know, everything here is pretty solid. Songs like The Gold, It's In The, and What's A The Deal, weird track titles, and Childhood's End, and Free Four, you know, they're solid tunes here, and Stay has a really great chorus as well. Um, there's a lot of good tracks, but nothing altogether memorable, I mean, the one thing that I take off this album as being like really excellent is the instrumental work Mud Men, where David Gilmour just makes that fucking guitar cry, which we all know he's so good at doing. But, you know, it's, it's a solid record, there are good songs, I don't have much to say about it, there really isn't much to say about it. It's a totally inessential release, and it really just bridges the gap between two albums that are vastly superior to this one. Not recommended unless you're already a fan of the band, but if you are, this is good, it's got some good songs, and it's cool to hear, I suppose. Memories of a man in his old age Are the deeds of a man in his prime Shuffle in the gloom of the sick room and talk to yourself as you die. Digging away the moments that make up a dull day. And here is the big one the album that everybody fucking knows, whether you're a fan of Pink Floyd or not, whether you've heard it or not. That, that album are right there is one of the most iconic in all of rock music, perhaps even the most iconic. This album holds the record for having been on the Billboard Hot 200 for the longest number of weeks. I think it was on for what, 11 years, seven years? I might be wrong, whatever. It was a long fucking time is basically what I'm trying to say anyway. And this thing just sold like goddamn wildfire, and to date, it's the third best-selling album of all time, only behind ACDC's Back in Black and Michael Jackson's Thriller. But you all already know how immense of an album this is, one of the biggest albums in music, one of the most well-known albums in music, and one of the most celebrated albums in music, particularly rock music anyway. And I am here to tell you that it absolutely deserves all of it. This record is absolute brilliance, and it's incredible that the band worked their way up to here. Not to say that metal wasn't excellent, because it was, but you listen to this, and it's the most fully realized encapsulation of this band's sound that they were cultivating to this point, and it's like it all happened in a snap. We're talking about an album that is the platonic ideal for the album format, for the, the flow of an album, as an album. I mean, this album's flow is utter perfection, one of the best I have ever heard. And it's not just because the songs literally flow into one another on each side, although that certainly helps, but it's that it has this just absolute mastery of the peaks and valleys ideology that to make the more hard-hitting moments of your album stick, it's gotta be sandwiched between softer moments. And to make those softer moments stick, they've gotta be sandwiched around the more hard-hitting moments. This makes the album feel like a journey, like a trip, and that by the end of it, you've had a real experience. And the production on this album is top class. Better than possibly most albums that are even released today. The sound of this record has not aged a second. Every instrument just has so much space to work within. You know, and, and it's much like I said when I was talking about metal, where if you have a nice stereo system, you can just sit in the middle of everything. It is beautiful. Every sound sounds absolutely stellar, as good as it could possibly sound. And the mix is also stellar. I mean, everything right where it needs to be. And we haven't even talked about the songs yet. Now, the album is often considered a concept album. I mean, only loosely, honestly. But it is still conceptual because certain songs are surrounded by other songs that continue their... Um, their theme, and sometimes they continue that theme purely sonically. Like with Time being followed by The Great Gig in the Sky, where Claire Torrey gives a chilling vocal solo. Absolutely fucking stellar. And it feels like every single note she's hitting is just full of emotion, packed with the existential punch that the last song just gave. And Time, the lyrics on this song, oh my god, are they sad. I mean, 
I can only imagine that the band members who are alive today are very much aware of what they meant when they were writing this song now. <laughs> the song is about how time moves so quickly. You know, it opens up with the realization when you're younger that you were never told when to really start having responsibilities and to start taking your time seriously and managing your time. And then in the second verse of the song, it seems like it's already too late. You're getting closer to death and the years are getting shorter. It's a theme that all of humanity can relate to, which must be one of the reasons why this album has been so enduring. And this song has a guitar solo that is goddamn breathtaking. It just rings with all of the emotion from the lyrics here and everything that this song is trying to say is all poured out into this fucking incredible guitar solo. And I love this long drawn out intro to this song that just gives way into the first verse and it's so hard hitting, it really sticks that landing. Possibly my favorite Pink Floyd track. That's not even to say anything of the other songs here, like the opener, well, kind of the opener, Breathe, which uh, just opens this album with so much color and it's just so vivid, but it's, it's very relaxing, you know, very much continuing in the ethos of metal. And the lyrics evoke imagery of, like, birth almost, you know, that you're finally out there in the open air, you can breathe it in, and, and that's a great way to open the album as well. Also, to color out this song's first verse, there's just these fantastic organ stings. I mean, god, the band's just playing so well together at this point. This is followed up by the rather experimental and electronic instrumental On The Run, which um, just has this, this uh, synth arpeggio the entire time back and forth, you hear, as you hear like sound effects from ear to ear and running and explosions and what sounds like helicopters and it's just crazy. Now, side two probably features more of a set of songs, really, uh, opening up with the always classic Money, with that amazing bass line in 7-4. But it doesn't feel like it's an odd groove. The groove really sticks the landing. It really sets in, you know? It, for a progressive rock track in 7-4, it doesn't feel like an odd time signature at all. It feels perfectly natural. It's just so groovy and chilled out, and once you get to this middle section of this song where it's just solo after solo, holy shit is it amazing! I mean, that sax solo is brilliant, and then, and that guitar solo, there's this genius time signature switch to 4-4 four, four to make this guitar solo hit even harder when it comes in. And man, does it fucking rock! It just kicks so much ass, and it's structured so well! It even sort of has a break in the middle of it before it gets back into it, even stronger than it did before. Such a well-structured solo. And by the time it returns to the song here, it just feels so seamless. Now this song transitions into the absolutely emotional and powerful anti-war song, Us and Them. This song uses such simple language to evoke such grand and powerful emotions in the verses here. It is absolutely gorgeous, and the sax playing just colors the whole thing out. It's beautiful. And when you get into the chorus, it is just so... I'm gonna use the word again, and I hate this word, but it's just so goddamn epic! And the scenes that are pictured in these choruses just give away the complete uselessness of war and fighting. This being followed up by the instrumental Any Color You Like, which has these amazing swirling keyboards in the beginning and a great guitar solo. It's just, again, it's structured so well and the sound is so colorful and vibrant. Which brings you into the album's closing duo, Brain Damage and Eclipse. Brain Damage inspired by their friend Sid Barrett, you know. Um, it's about going crazy. <laughs> And the way that this song transitions into Eclipse, these two tracks just feel fucking earth-shattering. And I mean, Eclipse is just one of the most breathtaking and wondrous and theatrical finishes to any album in rock. Manages to make everything feel connected without even saying too much. With this vocal mantra of all that you this, all that you that. Until finally closing with the statement that everything under the sun is in tune, but the sun is eclipsed by the moon. Just a brilliant album, a brilliant use of sonics, especially with those little questionnaire vocal lines that are led throughout that kind of make the album feel even thoughtier. It's just a brilliant work, and I would say I can't recommend it enough, but you've probably already heard it, so why would I need to tell you that? And if the dam breaks open many years too soon Now 
Now, I can't even imagine how difficult it must have been for Pink Floyd to follow up the dark side of the moon with the immense financial success it brought the band and probably the change in lifestyle it brought the band as well. And yet, somehow, the band pulled through and released a follow-up that is nearly as brilliant as its predecessor. Wish You Were Here, in comparison to Dark Side of the Moon, is a cooler album. It's a more pristine album, and it, it, even a more relaxed album, a more chilled out album. And it's also a more conceptual album, this one being about two things mainly, both of which are somewhat intertwined, and that's former bandmate Sid Barrett and, you know, his mental state, uh, or declining mental state, I suppose, and also just the music industry as a whole and how it lies to aspiring musicians and uses them. And I very much get the impression that there's a connection drawn between these two things. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that Roger Waters and the rest of the band were frustrated with how their label and the music industry had treated them and where it brought them. But I think more so than anything, their anger may be directed towards the industry for what it did to Sid Barrett. Now, the album is bookended by Shine On, You Crazy Diamond. It's a nine-part song that spans two separate tracks, one in the beginning of the album and one at the end. Now, Shine On You Crazy Diamond is probably the most direct reference to Sid Barrett on the record. But you've also got other moments, like the title track, that seem to be very much about Sid Barrett as well. Now, the sound fidelity and the production on this album is just as amazing as it was on Dark Side of the Moon. And as this album slowly opens up and fades in with this incredible synth work from Richard Wright, perhaps his best performance, his best performances with the band entirely are all on this record. And it's just beautiful how this album opens up and the instruments start to come in when you get this kind of watery guitar melody, which apparently reminded, I believe, Roger Waters of Sid Barrett until the band finally breaks in, and it is wonderful. You get a couple solos, sort of back to back for a little while as the song starts to progress, and every single one is top fucking notch, until eventually the song kicks in with a chorus that is goddamn huge. This is truly such an excellent song. I mean, the instrumental performances are the best they have ever been, and the structure of this track is so seamless. It is wonderful. This brings us into Welcome to the Machine, a much more stripped back song in comparison, although it doesn't feel like it emotionally. Richard Wright's synth work on this song especially is goddamn amazing. The synths just swirl around and fill out all the empty space here. There are these dark industrial noises in the background the whole time. The song is probably the darkest the album ever gets. Now, Roger Waters singing on this song isn't great, but it is definitely huge. And I love the lyrics on this song, almost written from like the perspective of an industry executive looking down on these creative musicians and bringing them in and, you know, turning them into robots, essentially. Which we get more of on the bluesier and cooler song, Have a Cigar, where we almost imagine like an industry exec, you know, like relaxing back in his chair with a cigar in his mouth behind a desk, talking to the band. And he wants to act like he knows them on a personal level, but he has no clue about anything about them. He doesn't actually care. It's only for the money. And the lyrics that Roger Waters writes on this song are particularly scathing. He seems very angry at these industry executives who wanted them to push an album out after Dark Side to keep making that money for the, you know, for the label, not for the band. The next track is the legendary title song, one of the most bittersweet and beautiful things that the band ever did. I love the transition between these two songs, by the way, which sounds almost like uh, it's coming out of a radio or perhaps even like a shitty 70s car stereo. And as the melody is playing under this thick static, David Gilmour then plays this wonderful acoustic guitar solo with perfectly clean production over that like static filled guitar in the background. It's a really cool effect. And then the song finally starts to get going and it is beautiful. The lyrics are incredible. It is tear-jerking, but at the same time, it's not depressing. Like I said, very bittersweet. And then the album ends with the rest of Shine On You Crazy Diamond, which I don't like as much as the first five parts, but still, the solos and the movements on this leg of the song are all fucking great as well. I mean, again, amazing instrumental performances all over this thing. It's got a great vibe, a great atmosphere, another great flow. 
And uh, yeah, I think it deserves its classic status as well. And did we tell you the name of the game? So this album could very much be called Pink Floyd's answer to punk rock, and also their answer to the political landscape of the UK at the time, or very much Roger Waters' answer to that, because this was his band at this point. This album is inspired by George Orwell's brilliant novel Animal Farm, except this time it is a scathing critique of crony capitalism, or just capitalism in general, really separating the groups of people in this society into dogs, pigs, and sheep. The dogs being the ruthless businessmen, the pigs being the politicians, and the sheep being the masses, unwilling and uncaring to all of the awful things that are going on around them. So again, we've got a very structured concept, and I would argue that Animals is their tightest and best executed concept album. And besides being that, I also view this as their greatest work. Similarly to Wish You Were Here, this album is also bookended by two versions of the same song. We've got Pigs on the Wing Part 1 and Pigs on the Wing Part 2, although this time they're not nearly as big of centerpieces. They're really just bookends. They're really short, nice little sweet acoustic guitar songs that then transition into the absolute darkness of the rest of this album. This is, far and away, the darkest Pink Floyd album. And you even hear it sonically. Compared to the last two records, the production on this album, the sound of this album, is a lot harsher. And at first, that put me off, but over time I grew to really appreciate the way the sound of this album complements its message and theme. And let's be clear, it still sounds amazing. So the first major song here is the 17-minute Dogs. The lyrics on this track are so biting and scathing and they make you view these ruthless businessmen as really violent and vicious people. However, we also see that in the end, they're going to live another sad old man all alone and dying of cancer. We understand that as much anger as we may have towards this group, they're merely making the best out of this system that everyone's trying to make the best out of. I'm not saying that the song is necessarily sympathetic to them, but it's honest. Just the fantastic acoustic guitar rhythm that colors out the entirety of this song is so goddamn good! And that doesn't even get me started on the fucking guitar solos, both of which on this song are just incredible! Just, it, there's just a, an amazing fucking build and progression to these solos. And really, the entire song, it actually changes quite a bit, but you'd hardly even notice because it's so smooth and seamless with every transition. And then there's this incredible synth solo that Richard Wright gets, which is very, very long. It's like three or four, maybe even five minutes here. Um, and it just, it's so understated for a lot of it. You're hearing dogs barking, going kind of ear to ear, and they sound like they have a chorus effect over them. But as this solo slowly progresses, he begins to add more and more to this atmosphere that he's building up with the synths. And it, it just gets fucking incredible at a certain point. It's so trippy and expansive. And in the final stretch of the song, where Roger Waters sings, and you believe at heart everyone's a killer, who was this, who was that, who was this, sort of the beliefs that these dogs have about the rest of society and what humanity is, and, you know, human nature, as so many people often point to. This finish to this song is incredible. It is breathtaking. And you really feel like you've gotten somewhere at the end of this song that made this whole journey worth it. This whole track just feels so progressive. It is fucking stunning. And the, so is the next song, Pigs, three different ones. Obviously a reference to the three little pigs, although there are actually three politicians who Roger Waters writes about, one of which he directly calls out, that being Mary Whitehouse. Now this song is definitely a lot heavier than the last song. It's got much more of a rock bass, featuring an incredible solo where David Gilmour's guitar sounds like a fucking pig. It is so cool. And these great choruses that heavily utilize cowbell in the rhythm section, where he 
he suggests that these these politicians, like the entire song, he's suggesting that they're people to be scoffed at, to be mocked, to be laughed at, with the lyrical refrain and hook of ha ha, charade you are. This song especially works as the centerpiece to the album because we get the impression that the pigs are really the core of all of this chaos. And we know that they're clearly the ones that Roger Waters hates the most and has the most negative things to say about because even the dogs, there was clearly some sympathy for them at points. There is no sympathy given for these pigs. And yet again, this song closes out with this incredible fucking sequence that makes us feel like we got somewhere, like it was all worth it. Another fantastic solo from Gilmore. And the guitar work on this whole track is great and it's super harsh and kind of gritty. And this brings us into what is very much the closer, Sheep. Now we're talking about the masses who know nothing about what's going on. This is very much the most exciting song on the record. It is fucking enthralling. And the way that Roger Waters' vocal lines like transition into synths is so fucking creative and cool. And this song also gives itself breathing room. There are quite a few moments where it gives you a break from the excitement only to get right back into it, making it feel more and more exciting each time it happens. Until you get to the final stretch of the song where the sheep kill the dogs. Now, this can be interpreted a number of ways. You can look at this as a good thing or a bad thing, but I think given the fact that the pigs were very much the center of all the criticism, notice how the sheep don't kill them. They rise up and kill the businessmen. And with the lines, you better stay home and do what you're told, get out of the road if you want to grow old, you can tell that Waters doesn't necessarily see this as a good thing. But this transitions into the most climactic moment of, I will say it, Pink Floyd's entire career. The outro to this song is orgasmic. It is enormous. And it is so simple too, but the sound of it is fucking arena filling. It's incredible. Every single song to this point has ended in a segment that made that song feel worth it, but this song had the challenge of having to make everything else feel worth it as well, and my god does it do it. And as this fades out into Pigs on the Wing, we do get that glimmer of hope at the end of the record. It's not all darkness. But still, this album is a biting and scathing critique of capitalism, and beyond that, it is just a brilliantly conceived concept. Never again or before has Pink Floyd had as tight of a concept on a record. Wish You Were Here seemed, sort of had two things going on at once, and they worked together, but, you know, Dark Side of the Moon, it had loose concepts here or there, and it ties itself together, but it wasn't really a tight concept. This album is as tight of a concept album as you can possibly get, and I am just in love with it. I think this is their best work, and it's honestly in my top three favorite albums of all time. So yes, 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 I recommend this so strongly. So by this point in the band, Roger Waters was really beginning to overpower everybody else. It was very much his creative vision now. You know, Animals was also entirely his vision, but the band really felt like a band. They really felt like Pink Floyd. Everybody played their part. You know, Richard Wright got Molt got a few solos, and Gilmore got a few great solos, and on every single track, you really felt like it was a band effort, even if it truly wasn't. However, on the wall, you start to see it become much more Roger Waters featuring David Gilmore, Richard Wright, and Nick Mason. Which isn't a bad thing because Roger Waters' vision on this record is great. So this is a rock opera about a rock star named Pink who the success just gets to his head and all of his negative influences when he was young and growing up and becoming a rock star have really boiled over and now that he's huge, he's built up this wall around him separating him from everybody else which was inspired by how Roger Waters felt on the um, In The Flesh tour, I believe it was. And as a result, two songs on this album are named after that tour, In The Flesh and In The Flesh. So this is the band's second double album after Umma Gumma, although this one has a lot more focus and also a lot more songs. 
There are a ton of tracks on this thing, and nothing as long as, you know, like something like Shine On You Crazy Diamond, or Echoes, or any of the tracks on um, Animals. Uh, this album really works together to create this, co this cohesive whole of a ton of smaller tracks, transitional tracks, and of course the big songs, the centerpieces. And quite a few of the songs off of this thing have gone on to be classic rock radio staples. I'm talking Another Brick in the Wall Part 2, Young Lust, Comfortably Numb, Hey You, and Run Like Hell as well. There are a lot of really recognizable songs on this thing. Now this album's concept I think is great. I think the rock opera here is a really good idea because it's a vague enough story that you can make music about it and it won't just feel like musical theater. Now at points this album does feel like that and that's perfectly fine, it's a rock opera, but it also, it allows itself to have more artistic expression in the sonics of the album and not just the lyrics. And the production on this thing, again, is pristine and incredible. You hear it as soon as that amazing riff comes in on the opener in the flesh. And I think that the flow for the entirety of the first disc of this thing is fantastic. You know, maybe it's not quite as great as the flow of like Dark Side of the Moon. It's still, this album still feels like it does have a bit too much waiting around for the exciting stuff, but even the points where you're waiting around, you've got some really great atmospheric stuff going on and some, some really creative, uh, really creative work, like on Another Brick in the Wall Part 1 with this just fantastic like guitar licks and just it's super, um, atmospheric and kind of creepy and eerie. Same thing with like Empty Spaces that fantastically kicks into Young Lost. Young Lost being this really fucking excellent like parody or satire of sleazy 70s rock. And it's really clever actually because it uses this to highlight how empty of a lifestyle this is for our lead character Pink. Whereas any other song like this would glorify this lifestyle. Now, I do think this album gets pretty goofy and dumb a lot of the time. Like the opening to one of my turns, for example, Roger Waters singing is kind of silly and, you know, and also on tracks like Mother, some of the lines are kind of silly and plenty of other parts too. Roger Waters sounds a little goofy all over this thing, but it really works because again, he's playing a character and this character is a little fucked up, so it makes sense. But I love that this album is a bit goofier, a bit more light than the last three. I mean, the concept's dark, and it gets really dark at points, but it's not as, like, overbearingly dark as Animals, or, um, you know, as existential as Dark Side, or sad as Moments of Wish You Were Here. And the album does a really good job a lot of the time of surrounding its most exciting and best songs with nice transitional pieces that really um, make those songs feel more important. However, sometimes it goes a little overboard with that, like on side three, where between Hey You and Comfortably Numb, every track is like one long valley between these two peaks, and it just doesn't feel like there's enough going on between these two songs. Which is not to say that, like, the stuff there isn't good. I mean, Nobody Home is fantastic, but I just think flow-wise, it does start to suffer a little bit on the second disc, just on the whole. But the music within is still, for the most part, really fucking great. And of course, Comfortably Numb is like one of the band's best songs, containing two David Gilmour solos that are fucking legendary. And Hey You as well is phenomenal. And it's just a great, like, there's great interplay between Roger Waters and David Gilmour on the vocals here. And in the final song where Pink goes insane and starts to kind of become a fascist dictator or like a surrogate band does, or I honestly kind of lose track, but whatever. You can tell the dude's going fucking nuts and it's gone too far. And um, then eventually it all kind of boils over on like waiting for the worms. And uh, he then gets put on trial. And the trial is such an entertaining song. It's like this musical theater song. It's like nothing else on the record. So ending it on this track, or kind of ending it on this track, it, it's a little bit of a weird choice, but it's so much fun, and it's like, the different characters and voices that Waters does is super entertaining, and like, at the same time, there's, there's that distinct darkness to it, and there's one moment where you really feel for Pink and what's become of him. But it's where all of these negative influences, you know, like, his mother being too protective, and also, you know, the way that the schools treated him. On the famous song, Another Brick in the Wall Part 2, where the band infuses some disco into their sound, it's really cool, like a children's choir. That song's another negative influence, the way that the schools treated him, and um, all this pointless sex, and just everything. And it all boils over into this song. It's, it's entertaining, it's a good end. And then Outside the Wall finishes the album on a super introspective note that I actually really like.
And, and so the album feels a lot more theatrical, more rock opera, because it is a rock opera. Uh, and it's a really fantastic one. Perhaps the best one ever made, at the very least one of the best ones ever made. And, uh, you know, I think its popularity is a real testament to its staying power. It is, this is an immensely popular record with tons of immensely popular classic rock radio staple songs. And all of it deserves it. It's a really great concept, maybe not as tight as Animals, but uh, still a really great concept and a really great double album that's just t so much fun. It's super entertaining. And of course, it has its darker moments. It has its sadder moments, its creepier moments. But on the whole, it's just, uh, just, it's, it's just a great record. This is such a fucking great record. Goodbye, Max. Goodbye, Ma. So remember how I said that Roger Waters was starting to take over the band by the wall? Well, that's true, but you still got a lot of amazing David Gilmour solos and, well, barely any Richard Wright. But he was still kind of there. This album is a Roger Waters solo album. I mean, I mean, it is. Like, it's called The Final Cut, A Requiem for the Post-War Dream by Roger Waters. It's only Pink Floyd in name, and I mean, yeah, David Gilmour and Nick Mason are there, although Richard Wright fucked off because he, he was tired of the fact that he kept getting, his influence kept getting pushed out. He had less and less of a presence on albums like Animals and especially The Wall, and he was just done, and I, I can't blame him. Now, Roger Waters penned a lot of anti-war songs throughout the band's history, and that's because he had a familial connection to it. His dad died in World War II, and so he wrote a lot of lyrics about that, and he wrote an entire album about that. And now let me point out that the lyrics on this record are poignant and really fantastic. Uh, as an anti-war protest album, if you could even call it a protest album, but it's definitely anti-war. I mean, this is, it's a great work. Lyrically, it's a great work. Because, um, there's really not much else there, is there? No, no, no there really isn't. I mean, you got like a Gilmore solo here or there. I can only think of like one, but there might be more than one. You got some perfectly listenable music, um, and that's it. And it's like whenever the album has anything more, any more excitement to give you, like a really great chorus or a hook or a great refrain or something like that, it's like it's never confident in itself because it always ends like way too quickly. Like on the opener here, the post-war dream, which explodes into this great moment that reminds me a bit of some of the parts on the wall, and then it just like stops as soon as it begins. And the album does this a lot. It, it, it's like, seriously, it is not musically confident in itself. And yes, it's a depressing listen, no doubt, but the music just doesn't bring anything out of me for the most part. Like, some of the tracks are okay. The Gunner's Dream has is like a solid enough ballad, but everything's just kind of all right. It's just kind of fine. And the one point when it does bubble over in like this rock song, or, or I should say this big ball swinging rock song, Not Now John, it's pretty fucking shitty. <laughs> Like, that, that's a very annoying and dumb song, and I cannot take it seriously. And I don't even know that I was supposed to, but even if I wasn't, it's fucking stupid. I mean, this album is like if you took the most introspective moments on the wall and basically stretched them out for an entire album. And that's not really interesting. <laughs> Like, if I was just talking about the lyrics booklet, then man, A+, plus. this is a phenomenal lyrics booklet. But I'm talking about this album as music, and it's just not impressive in any way. It just does almost nothing for me throughout its runtime. Now, I'm sure this album has its fans, and I can understand why you might really enjoy this. Um, but for me, it's just... It's just a nothing record. It's like a record I forget even exists a lot of the time, and frankly, I hardly even think about it when I think of Pink Floyd because it doesn't feel like a Pink Floyd album at all. However, if you like The Wall and you like Roger Waters' lyricism, I think you should check this out because you might get more out of it than I do. I mean, I like The Wall and I like Roger Waters' lyricism and I don't get anything out of it, but you might. But if Roger Waters ever like annoys you, then you need to stay the hell away from this because this is pure fucking waters right here. This is, this is peak waters. But anyway, I, I don't care for it.
so the band broke up or went on hiatus or whatever, but uh, they got back together without Roger Waters. And this pissed Roger Waters off, but we're not going to talk about that. Now we have a band led by David Gilmour and also featuring Richard Wright and Nick Mason. So they're a trio now and David Gilmour is now the front man. This is the Gilmour led era. And uh, yeah, it makes you really wish Roger Waters, doesn't it? It really does. This album is garbage. Like, it's just bad. First of all, one of the best things about 70s Floyd was the production, the sound fidelity. This album sounds like it was shat out of a synthesizer. I mean, yes, it's mixed very well, but all of the sounds contained therein just sound like crap. They sound cheesy and just so dated in 80s. Especially on moments like the verses of Learning to Fly or parts of Terminal Frost that sound like 80s sitcom music. And the songs here are just plain bad. They're just a bunch of slogs and just kind of icky garbage. I mean, you've got stuff like Sorrow, which has its interesting moments, but it just doesn't know what to do for eight minutes. And then you've got the instrumental pieces, Signs of Life and Terminal Frost, which are played very well and they flow nicely, but it's like, but they're just so... Eh. And on top of that, you've got the worst fucking song the band ever did, The Dogs of War where David Gilmour tries to be Roger Waters and write an anti-war song, and it is laughably bad. Dogs of War! Men of Hate! And you've got the really gross ballad on the turning away, which is just such a goddamn slog. I mean, yes, the guitar solo in the second half has a great progression, it's great, but it's built on top of a crappy song, so it's like, it's not earned. And this album tries all the Pink Floyd stops. You know, you've got the female backing vocalist, you've got the, you know, lengthy solos, you've got the sound effects, the song transitions into each other, and all those kinds of things, but nothing about it feels like it has real energy put into it, or real care, or artistic vision, or anything that those 70s albums had so much of. And, you know, there are also other songwriters brought on here, and if anything, that just makes the songs more boring. All in all, it's just a crappy album, and yes, it was definitely a momentary lapse of reason. So the Division Bell is, by all accounts, an attempt to be a big return to form. You can tell. Like, the production feels more pristine and much more in vain with what Pink Floyd was doing in the 70s, and, you know, just the songs themselves sound like they're really trying to be like that. You can tell that there was a very clear attempt to avoid what they did with the momentary lapse of reason and go back to their quintessential sound. And at points, I think they rekindle that, but the problem is you've still got Gilmore as the frontman here, and he's just not a good songwriter. He just, he just can't write good songs. And again, you've got those instrumentals that just feel kind of whatever. But there is actually a decent amount of solid material on here, like Pulls Apart's a very good song, and um, so is uh, Keep Talking is, is, is cool, and uh, High Hopes is a very good finish for the band. I think a lot of people could agree on that. Uh, and my two favorites on here are Take It Back, where Pink Floyd tries to be U2 and it somehow works, and also um, Lost For Words, which I think is kind of a gem that no one really talks about, but it's a very nice, very nice track. And you can tell a lot of the lyrics are reflecting on the beef that uh, Gilmore and Roger Waters had. You know, these two people used to be friends and they just started to hate each other. And you can tell that Gilmore regrets that on this record and on a lot of the lyrics. And, and I like that. The problem is that you've still got slogs on this album, like fucking Wearing the Inside Out with just a stupid vocal melody that I do not enjoy. And also Coming Back to Life, which has this really awful guitar sound that sounds like total shit and a slog like A Great Day for Freedom, and Marooned, and Cluster One, and it's like, it's just whatever. Look, as a rekindling of Pink Floyd's sound, it's decent. The album has its stronger moments, and it is definitely an improvement over A Momentary Lapse of Reason and the final cut. I mean, this is the first time Pink Floyd sounds like Pink Floyd since The Wall. 
And perhaps this even sounds more like the central Pink Floyd sound than that does. Like this is very much going back to the earlier 70s stuff but I just don't feel like it has the grandiosity of those albums, or the importance of those albums, or really anything that made those things so exciting to begin with. This record is fine, it's okay, and I think a Pink Floyd fan will enjoy this. I mean, I, I enjoy it fine, but all in all, it's just nothing altogether special, really. So finally, as a bit of a tribute to the passing of the amazing keyboardist Richard Wright, um, we get this album in 2014, the final Pink Floyd album. It's not really a reunion album because it's using a lot of stems and material that was kind of left over from the Division Bell sessions, except now it's kind of overdubbed and um, re-recorded and, you know, you got the song uh, Louder Than Words, which is like new, kind of, I think, although maybe the lyrics were old, I don't fucking know. Point is, it's a lot of Division Bell stuff, it's very much of that era still, and Gilmore is still at the helm of it. But this album is almost entirely instrumental, until the very final track there are no songs on the record. I mean, there's like vocals here or there, but no songs, no lyrics. And you know, instrumental Floyd really ain't that bad. It's uh, very nice and listenable and comforting and uh, it flows really nicely and the production's pristine and incredible. I mean, you could almost look at this album as like a production showcase because not really any of the individual moments are anything special. I mean, I think It's What We Do and Surfacing are pretty good, um, but most of it's just kind of all right. It's kind of decent, it's nice, it's pleasant, but that's about it. But again, it, it flows really well. There's some good instrumental performances. Um, and honestly, I think a lot of the material here is better than the material on the Division Bell. Maybe on account of them being only instrumental, I don't know. But this is a pleasant album. It's definitely good background music, if nothing else. Um, and it doesn't have many bad moments, besides maybe Anacena, which sounds like sitcom music again. But yeah, it's, uh, it's fine. And it's cool to hear some Richard Wright stuff that you never really got to hear in this format before, after he died, as like a tribute to him. I think it's really nice. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's uh, perfectly fine. That's really all I can say about it. I mean, it's kind of a shame we view this as the final Pink Floyd album. I mean, we really don't. Everybody still kind of sees the vision bell that way. But technically, this is the final record. And, like, as a going away note, even though I actually prefer this to the division bell a little bit, Division Bell's still a better going away note, because you still have the closing, or you still have the closing two tracks, Lost for Words and High Hopes, which was like really an encapsulation of a lot of the emotions of the band, and it just felt like a good ending to the band. Whereas this album doesn't at all. But uh, you can always look at it as like a coda, you know? This is the postscript of Pink Floyd, and as that, it's nice. It's, it's nice. That's really all it is. But yeah, probably not worth hearing until you've heard literally everything else the band did. So that covers the discography of this incredible band. If you haven't listened to a Pink Floyd album, please just do it. The Dark Side of the Moon, Wish You Were Here, Animals, The Wall, I mean, Metal, I mean, just take your pick. Um, but they have so many great albums, and and when they hit their stride in the 70s, man, it, it's, it was something to behold, I can only imagine. Bye, guys.
was caught in a cauldron of hate. 